you know, sort of like the New York City of the day. Everybody knew everything. The one thing that the, that the believers discovered that was so different was that Jesus lived inside of them. And that, uh, you know, a lot of times we say that. We say, oh, well, Jesus came into me when I accepted him, or I have Jesus living in me. And it's good to stop and think about, well, what does that mean? Is that a little tiny Jesus sitting in there? No, no, it's not what's happening. It's his holy spirit living in us. It was a spiritual event. He came in, and from that moment, we went from death to life. I mean, that's really profound. And the, in the first century, that was not lost on them. They went, oh my gosh, something dramatic has changed in me. And it's not like I all of a sudden got religion or something like that. They have plenty of religion. The thing that happened is the Holy Spirit came and made his dwelling in them. And then it was his job to start from the very center of their being to transform them from the inside out. All the religions of the world were saying, eat this, practice that, build this building, do this thing. They had all these outside things and saying, you know, God will somehow creep his way into your life. But the creator of the universe said, no, I want to come into the very center of your being and I want to transform you from the inside out. And that's how the light of Christ to shine out of us on all these people. So this is a, an important thing we're looking at here. Um, my university sense said, we didn't get through the syllabus. We didn't finish what we were supposed to finish. And God told me, he said, Charlie, man, you finished exactly what we were supposed to finish. <laughs> we did exactly last week what we were supposed to do. Don't, don't go trying to micromanage what I am doing. You know? And uh, don't worry about the schedule. I'll take care of the schedule. But um, came back to, to visit this. And I'd like to take a moment and pray just that God would stir the Holy Spirit living in each one of us. And by the Holy Ghost, we can, we can really hear what he's saying to us. Father in heaven, I am thankful to you, Lord, that you changed me that you changed all my brothers and sisters here. That we have a hope, um, a hope that's real, an anchor for our souls, and this is all because um, your spirit lives in us, and so we know, we know. The rest of the world doesn't know. They go, what's, what's happened to that? Uh, we don't get it. What, uh, that's what's happening. We know because your Holy Spirit lives in us. So now we pray that your spirit would speak to each one of us personally we would hear from you, uh, not so we become smarter or more crafty or we can say we know the Bible better, but so that we can be changed, that we can be like Jesus. That's what we all want, Lord. So we give you this time now in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to read this just to try to keep things cruising along here. Let me read this section, Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through 8. Now, this is just after what we talked about last week, like when the disciples privately said, Lord, teach us to pray. So, subsequent to that, he said to them, suppose one of you, one of you, one of you has a friend, and he goes to him at midnight and says, friend, lend me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. Then the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door's already locked. My children are in bed with me. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him the bread because he is his friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. 
So I say to you, well, we'll get to that in a second. Okay, he's giving uh, an example that they should draw on because he says, imagine yourself in this situation. Here you are, middle of the night. I guess it does happen. Somebody shows up in the middle of the night. You didn't expect them to show up. And you're going, well, my friend is here. I need to feed him. Uh, what do I do? I don't have any food. So imagine you say, OK, I've got a neighbor here. We get along OK. They borrow a cup of sugar every once in a while. So I think I can go over and ask for a loaf of bread or two. So he, Jesus is, is telling them to imagine this for themselves. Imagine that you have this happen to you. So you go over next door. Now, you know, put yourself in the position of the person that's packed everything up, locked the door, kids are in bed, you know, they had animals in the house too, and all kinds of things. So everything's sort of hunkered down for the night, and we'll revisit things tomorrow, but... Huh? What's going on? And, oh, Tim from next door. We got these two scenarios going on. Now, Jesus points out that even though he's annoyed because it's midnight, my gosh, it's midnight, and we've all gone to bed, and this is a real inconvenience, but still, because you were bold enough to go over and do that, even at midnight, you knew that was, I mean, if, if you were in his shoes, you would have felt the same way. But you were bold enough to go next door, and the only excuse you had is, I got this friend that showed up and we, I got to feed him. But for your boldness, he'll go, okay, I'll help him. Or whoever it is. Go get some loaves of bread. That's the scenario that Jesus is uh, bringing up. So, um, why do you suppose he's giving this example? How is this, first of all, relevant to our corporate prayer for the seven things we pray for we talked about last week? And how is that, how is that feeding into this? First thing that comes first thing that comes to my mind is that uh, neighbors uh, we're not in it just for fun. So that was not one of the that was not one of the inputs there. The fact that he didn't feel like it was not a determining factor, and that should that should reflect on us. Another thing too is uh, the story always interests me is that the guy didn't have to uh, bang on the door a second time, a third time, a fourth time. Uh, he, asked, he asked. Uh, he waited, and the, the guy got up grouchy, okay, there's your stupid bread, mm -hmm. and, and I can bet you that the neighbor who borrowed the bread realized that that grouchiness was, did not take away from the gift at all, it had nothing to do with had to do with neighbor witness, verbal uh, yeah. community. Well, I, th I think too there's a lesson in perseverance and asking. I mean, because he kept asking for the bread, and you know. Did he persevere? I think the guy that was asking did. Well, kept on asking, and the neighbor wasn't very happy with that. The story only has him asking once. He asked once. 
He only asked once. And the neighbor came over to the door and gave him what he wanted. And it says that he did it because of his boldness. Because of his boldness. In the Hebrews it says, let us therefore step boldly for the door of grace to receive help in our time of need. I, I thought the reason that the Lord brought this out here. Oh. I thought the reason that the Lord may have brought um, this story here is to contrast God's great desire to help his children in contrast to this so-called friend. Uh, when he came to ask, he called him friend. The guy that answered him did not say friend. And um, he said, don't bother me. But he's contrasting God's desire to, to hear us at, at any time, in any situation, and um, that he wants to help his children. And, and, um, right. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, you know, I've heard whole sermons preached on this segment where I've heard people say, we've got to keep knocking on the door. We've got to keep banging on God. We've got to keep... But why did Jesus say, he, he knows before you can ask what you need. Is he impressed by the fact that you came back and banged a second time or a third time or a fourth time? I think God is is wanting to answer even our request for a loaf of bread. When I was a little kid, I didn't believe in, in Jesus then, but my, my mother took me to Sunday school. And she was part of a church where I won't mention what kind it was, but at any rate, I remember that that I was I was raised being taught that God's all-powerful and he's out there and he created the universe and all this kind of stuff. Don't bother him. He's busy. He's running a planet. He's running a universe. You know? So don't go asking for, oh, gee, I really want a muscle man for my Christmas present. I really want one. Oh, God, give me this, you know. They were, mm, you greedy little kid. You shouldn't be bothering God with such prayers. You know? Or... I really wish my daughter would come for Thanksgiving. Don't bother God with that silly little whim of yours. I really wish somebody at school would invite me to come over and play. God doesn't care about you playing. God's busy. That was the message I was taught. That was the message. God created us because of his great love for us. He created us to be fashioned in his image. That was not a whim. That was a real, sincere desire. And before he even created us, he had already decided, I'm going to become one of them. I'm going to step into a body just like that. He had to come down and be born a baby, a Mary, a human, in order for him to become one of us. So that he could be touched by everything we're touched by. Jesus wanted a muscle man for Christmas. Jesus wanted a friend to come play with him. And what God is saying is, I love you that much. I want you that much that I, I step into your world to be one of you in order that I can bring you to me. Jesus, when he was about to be crucified, was going, oh, this, I, I don't like this idea. Uh, please, God, is there some other way, Father? Is there some other way? That was not some kind of religious act on his part. He really 
was in pain, thinking of, this is not going to be fun. This is not something I personally want. I've got friends here. I, I, I don't want to leave my friends. I, you know, I, I yeah. <laughs> but he obeyed God. He obeyed God because he saw the bigger picture as our Father in Heaven sees the bigger picture. And he thought, it's for this reason I came here in the first place. So I need to do what God has, has put me here to do. And that's all an expression of how much our Father loves us. Why would he care how many hairs are on our head, except that he cares about even the tiniest things? Even the tiniest things. Things tinier than we know, he cares about them. He sees them all. He wants us to be there. He really wants us to be there. And this is... This is a good example because I, I think sometimes we we think of the neighbor in the mind of um, you know the, the, the religious order of the day, like you know you're you're really imposing on the neighbor. You shouldn't do that. But the neighbor was like, "You got up at midnight. I don't like this, but." The royal, the, the royal law of Jesus is love your neighbor as yourself. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get him three loaves of bread to take that. And he did. It's three loaves of bread. <laughs> According to the text here, he didn't give the guy the bread to get him off his back. He gave it to him because he was his because he was bold or something. No, no, no. So the, the giver of the bread gave it as a, not to get rid of this pesky guy, but because he was his friend. No, wow. no, but my, my interpretation, not mine, I'm sorry. <laughs> the, we know what you're saying. What is it? Version. Version, thank you, says, um, I tell you, though, he will not get up and give him the bread because he is his friend. Right. Yet, because of the man's boldness, oh, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. Thank you, Larry. <laughs> so, in light of that, so in light of contrast, I'm sorry? So he's contrasting man's generosity to God's amazing generosity to so much greater than what we can ever do. God, God doesn't answer it because we've done things right. First time I ever prayed, first time I ever prayed, I wasn't doing anything right. But he answered the prayer. <coughs> And since then, there's been plenty of occasions when I was praying and I wasn't, didn't have it right because God answered my prayer. So it's not, it's not a reciprocation. It's one of the big lessons of the book of Job is, is God doesn't answer us according to what we necessarily have deserved. Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if we talk about what do we really deserve, we all deserve to die and go to hell. Thank you. You know, and he didn't do that. He gave his son so that that wouldn't happen. Remember this contrast between grace and mercy? Grace is, you know, grace is getting what we don't deserve, and mercy is not getting what we do deserve. Okay. So let's, let's look at his immediate subsequent Comment. Okay, he repeats something that he said on the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus realized he had to sort of drive things home by repeating himself. He did quite a bit. So this is in uh, verses 9 through 13. So I say to you, this is Jesus talking to his disciples, I say to you, 
Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now, a very bold thing. Jesus said, everyone that asks gets. Everyone that seeks finds. And everyone who knocks on a door has the door open for them. And I've had people say, well, I know lots of examples where I pray or other people have prayed. Good thing. And it didn't happen. Is Jesus making things up? Yeah. You this, wanna, is just a, can you just, this? this is just a. This is just something that stuck with me ever since oh, when I was a little kid. You know, hundred years ago. Um, I went to our family went to a local Methodist church on a hill just across the valley from our house in eastern Nebraska, and in this little brick church two gigantic stained glass windows and one of them on the right was of Jesus knocking at the door and the other was of, on the other side was of Jesus carrying a lamb and bringing a lamb beside him and those two pictures have stuck in my mind all these years and when I talk about Jesus knocking at the door that window comes into my mind again I can still see the, the silly thing you know like because it's just glass but it's it makes you, it makes me stop and think and talk to the Lord about it. And I just think those kind of pictures are kind of neat. Mm -hmm. Little kid things. Oh. Let me ask you a question here. When you have asked God, and I, I say you, I mean all of us as you, when, when you have asked God for something, have you ever thought, I know the answer I want? An honest person here. <laughs> I know the answer I want. But was that answer that you want always... I don't think we need to chase down that rabbit very far. I think every one of us would be quick to say, we may want something that we ask for, but that may not be the best answer. But if we got the best answer, <coughs> is it okay that we didn't get the answer we wanted? Is it no an answer? It's fortunate. Yeah. Yeah. Now, for those of us that are our parents, um, Junior asks for something and you go, No, I'm not going to give you that. But you don't give it to your kid because you've got something better in mind. And the kid doesn't matter, No, I want this, I want this, I want this. And I go, Oh, no, hang on, hang on. And then you give them what, what is better. And they go, ah, this is all of a sudden the thing they wanted sort of like vanishes. The thing they thought was the answer to their request disappears because of the joy of what was really coming for them. And you know better than your kids because you have a bigger perspective. You see the bigger picture. They see what's right in front of them. You see the whole family. You see the house. You see what's happened yesterday. You see what's happening tomorrow. And you're thinking about all these things. You put the picture, the, the, all the elements of the picture together. 
that you can answer your own kid in a way that really meets what their heart is asking for, what they really want. Now, think about the creator of the universe. He sees what happened last century. He sees what happened last week. He sees, he can see what will happen next week and what will happen a hundred years from now. So he sees a much bigger picture than we as parents ever saw with our own kids. And Jesus just used that example. What about you? You, you are parents. Don't you know how to give a good thing? You know. So our Father in Heaven, did, are, is there such a thing as an unanswered prayer? I think about that. Um, and for, we're talking about believers here. Uh, you know, they're for a believer, no, I don't think so. For an unbeliever, I don't know. I don't know uh, if there's only one prayer that that God answers for the unbeliever, or if there are more. I don't know that. But for a believer, yes, God answers all this. Is an unbeliever asking our Father in heaven? Not at that point, no. No, but when they do. They're a believer. Does our Father in heaven ever not answer their prayer? I think that you know there's a lot of people that are praying like this, they're praying to the wall, or they're praying in, in the Bible, or they're praying to a little statue that has nothing going on inside of it. Or they're praying to something. But when they turn to God, what Jesus is saying. He will always answer. He will always answer. Everyone that asks, everyone that knocks, everyone that seeks, they always get what they're really looking for, what they're really asking, what they really want to go into. Because our Father in Heaven sees the whole story. So He answers that. I, I think it, yeah, please. I, I just am grappling with this because it seems to me that there is a time for some people who haven't chosen to follow Jesus. They think there's a higher power. They're trying to figure it out. <clears throat> They're in a desperate situation. God, if you're really out there, I need you. I think he would answer that prayer even if they haven't proclaimed that he is the creator God because I... he cares. You bring up a great point, Laurel, and that is there's there's all kinds of stories about people that, that didn't know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And they prayed something like that. God, if you're out there, I did that. I did that. I didn't even believe in God. But I was like, if you're out there, hmm, help. <laughs> it was a pretty simple prayer, right? <laughs> help. <laughs> and but was I believing then? Wanting to help me in my unbelief, I don't know. But if you're there, I need you. So it's a it's a fine line because you must believe somebody's possibly there, or you wouldn't pray that prayer. Yet you're not convinced. Yet you need help. I it's can't it's like Jesus told the woman at the well. He said, "You Samaritans, you 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 don't know what you're what you're worshiping." We Jews, we know what we're worshiping. He wasn't trying to be arrogant, like, we're cool, you guys are dirty. That wasn't what he was doing at all. He was pointing out just a fact. I was a Samaritan, and I was worshiping I know not what. I was a unbeliever, and I was believing in something I knew not what. And Jesus, who had the oracle from God, the truth of God, he heard that. So, Actually, I wonder if that even changes now. A lot of times we are praying and we don't really know the mind of God. It's, 
understand God's help on this. I don't, I don't even know what I'm asking. One thing that, that I take um, uh, relief in, if you will, about whether God answers or not is, I always forget where these scriptures are, but the God of peace, the peace that passes all understanding, will guard your, your mind and your heart in Christ Jesus. Or guard your mind and your heart. So it's more, I think if you are a believer, you can feel that. The Holy Spirit gives that to you. It's not so much that if the answer is yes or no, it's that God allows us to accept with his peace what comes our way. So I don't know, personally, when I pray, I, you know, black or white, I don't expect a black or a white. I just expect an understanding and a peace that says this, the way this is going to happen is of God. I think that Jesus always answers prayer, but we shouldn't be too quick to think that uh, he's got, the answer is going to be yes. It might be that he uh, is testing our faith. There's like the Deuteronomy 8 too, talks about uh, God testing the people, but also uh, we might be asking on this, and if we're asking for something we shouldn't be asking for, Jesus answered, but the answer isn't yes, the answer is a no. Yeah. And of course, one of his answers is yes. He uses the example of you that are parents, and every one of us as parents would be quick to say, sometimes no is the best answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And sometimes it's an answer you don't expect. You don't expect the answer to prayer, but it's an answer, but it's not something you expect. Yeah. Kind of yeah. There's plenty of times we get the answer, we don't understand it. Mm -hmm. yeah, there is a, a verse, I think it's in Proverbs or Psalms, delight thyself in the Lord, and he will give you the um, desires of your heart. And if we believe in God, he, he's the one that gives, prompts, gives us that desire. Delight thyself in the yeah. Lord. That's a pretty deep thing. People, people argue about that like, oh, so-and-so didn't get healed because you didn't have enough faith. I, I, I have to say that there's even, I, I've been told by folks, you didn't get what you prayed for because you didn't have faith. If we had been there, we would have prayed. If we had faith, we would have gotten what you were looking for. And I, I felt like you're not a help at all, friend. <laughs> you're not helping this situation at all. And uh, I, I really, I don't think God walks around with a faith meter in his hand going, how much faith do you have? When you get to this point, I answer when you do. Because frankly, sometimes I'm just like that guy with his son going, Well, I believe, but help my unbelief. You know, sometimes I am, I'm not, I'm not talking about me, all of us. Sometimes we ask God and we barely have scratch. But we're still asking Him. We're asking Him because we believe in Him. And sometimes it's, it's okay, sorry. I, I don't know how this works. You see this with a bigger picture, God. And I, I know what I want, but I don't know what's necessarily right. And he, so I'm asking you, God. He oh. understands us, our deep desires. He knows our deep desires. I'm sorry. He gives us our deep desires. What he desires yeah. becomes our desires. Where'd that come from? <laughs> Larry. I was just going to say, sometimes he changes our desires. Hmm. Yes. As, as we pray, thy will be done. Yeah. And we really, our desire ends up changing. And that's what we we're asking for. I mean, when we, now, this actually leads really nicely to the next question. I think Mike gave us the teaser on this. And that has to do with why did, did he say, if you, being wicked, 
humans, fallen humans. I don't think he was going around judging everybody, going, you're all going to hell. He was just saying, you're, you're a fallen creature here. But you know how to give good things to your children. How much more, the creator of the universe, the pure, the holy God that created all, will give the Holy Spirit to those that ask it? Why did he put it that way? How do we have that hope which is an anchor to our soul? How do we have that confidence that it's going to come out the right way even if we don't get what the right way is? How do we know that whether God answers it the way we asked it and what our personal, at the moment, at the moment desire was, how do we have confidence that God's going to do it right? How do we have confidence that when the trumpet sounds, we're going where we think we're going? It comes from the ongoing conversation between our spirit and the Holy Spirit in us. Romans 8, 27 says, And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And read the next verse. <laughs> and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and in another place, it says the Spirit interacts with our spirit to assure us or to <clears throat> yeah, say, say it. Say it. Isn't, isn't that what you were saying, Mike? Isn't that what you were saying? There's a confidence that comes. Yeah. <clears throat> Actually, the uh, verse before where I started, uh, starting in uh, Romans 8, 26, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, <clears throat> but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through segment and I, it's a little bit long so I can't print it out but let me just summarize what's happening it says that Jesus was driving out a demon and some of the religious people were saying you're driving out demons by Beelzebub who is a pagan a, a pagan god and Jesus goes well, why would a pagan god drive out what he put in in the first place and then give glory to Yahweh? That's not, that doesn't make any sense at all. So that's, that's what Jesus is, is talking about. And he, says, he uses the example that any kingdom that's divided against itself can't stand. So there's no logic in what you say. There's no, it's irrational what you're saying. But then, he says, this is in verse 19, Now if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your followers drive them out? So then, they will be your judges. And then he says, But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. Now, he was using the example of driving out demons. And here we are in 2021, 
How many of you were talking to anybody about demons yesterday? Or the day before? How many of you even think about wicked spirits that need to be driven out of people? Isn't that, isn't that just the evil? I think that's a good question. I think it's a good question, too, because I often think about my own demons. You know, now, what they are, I, I know that the Holy Spirit is in me, but I know that there are these, these sins like Paul talked about, I don't do what I ought to do, and I do what I shouldn't do, and wow. Um, in that regard, but I do think about my my own demons. That would have gone through. You know, it's it's interesting that one of the things that the devil uses the most in our culture is to try to convince each one of us, each one of us, that he doesn't exist. But there are some cultures where there's no way on earth he's going to succeed at that. They see the devil working all around them, and they acknowledge the work of the devil as being the work of the devil. And it's very interesting that in those cultures, people see demon-possessed people all the time. So it begs the question, why in 21st century American culture do we want to um, dismiss the notion that there are such spiritual creatures. These are creations. These are, in some places, are called fallen angels. Why do, why do we want to dismiss that they even exist? Whereas you go other places, I mean, uh, I'm, not, I, I'm sure that Mary could tell you that, that Pete has gone places where he's bumped into some interesting people that were oppressing people that he was dealing with in some of the very, very remote parts of the, of the world. I used to live in Brazil, which is a very big country, and uh, their demonism is called spiritism, and there's a whole, about a third of the country follows spiritism, uh, where they're uh, Worshiping the Holy, uh, not the Holy Spirit, but uh, Satan, and they, uh, at their meetings, they dance around in a circle, uh, and as they uh, give themselves over to Satan, and uh, some of the people go into a trance and fall on the floor, and uh, it, it, it's just, uh, yeah. so sometimes that may seem very foreign in the United States, in some countries, uh, it's well known. I think it's dangerous for us if we if we start pretending that, that you know the writers of the Bible were primitive and they didn't know any better than to just call our sinful habits as demons, even though we sometimes call them that. And that's not necessarily wrong. We're not saying that they are wicked individual spirits, but there are wicked individual spirits. And Jesus was driving them out. When that kid was convulsing on the ground, that often threw himself in the fire. That was not some kind of fantasy. That was a, that was a, an evil spirit that was indwelling in that kid, and he drove that spirit away. And the kid was healthy. The kid was healed. And that's a very real thing. And I think that we shouldn't be dismissive of the things that that we see in the scripture, just because in our culture. The devil is trying not to divide his kingdom by having us start acknowledging his agents working all around us. They're really subtle. They try to stay in the background. They try to hang out outside the door and go, I'll whisper in so and so's ear or something as soon as they walk out. So it's a good thing for us to be asking God to deliver us from evil. To deliver us from evil. Deliver us from the evil that wants to whisper to our hands.